Welcome to Engaging Your Medical Providers and QAPI, brought to you by Alliant Health Solutions. I am Lisa Davies and will be joined by Dr. Swati Gar today. I would like to acknowledge that when we first released this educational session, Dr. Mamata Yamadala was supposed to be joining us today, but as does happen since the start of the pandemic, sometimes in our day we do have to have a quick shift and pivot as a result of COVID-19. And unfortunately, Dr. Yamadala was not able to join us today, but we are greatly appreciative of Dr. Swati Gar being able to join us today for this presentation as our medical expert. So I would like to acknowledge that we do have a poll to the right. If you would, please answer the questions in the poll and we will share the results when we get to our agenda slide. So we are very grateful that Dr. Gar has been able to join us today. Dr. Gar is coming to us with experience from as a medical director at New Horizons Nursing Facilities in Gainesville, Georgia with the Northeast Georgia Health System. She is also a um, attending physician at several other nursing facilities in the area. She has consulted with post-acute long-term care companies on optimizing medical services and post-acute and long-term care facilities, integrating medical directors and clinicians into the QAPI framework and creating these frameworks where there's interdisciplinary work within the organization. Dr. Gar has also recently been recognized as Medical Director of the Year by the Society of Post-Acute Care and Long-Term Care Medicine. I am joining you today with 20 years of healthcare experience, including as a long-term care administrator and certified professional in healthcare quality with a specialty in designing and redesigning quality frameworks and then working with skilled nursing facilities and implementing them and creating a framework for improvement of quality of care. I have also served as a quality committee chair, of the Georgia Healthcare Association, and currently work as a quality improvement manager for Alliant Health Solutions. And as we talk about health, Alliant Health Solutions, we are making healthcare better together at Alliant Health Solutions covering the seven states you see in this slide here. So now on to QAPI. And so what I'd really like to, to see is that we have seen in our poll that the most common answer is that my medical director attends regularly and provides input when asked. And so that was the largest percent of our answers, which I really like to see that the medical directors are providing some input when asked. But I hope for our presentation today that you will really see how we could drive medical directors into engaging actively rather than passively. So today on our agenda, we are gonna cover some regulations behind QAPI. We're gonna talk about effective formats and tools and frameworks for QAPI. And then Dr. Gar and I are both going to talk about and lead into engaging those medical provi providers in your QAPI process. We will cover physician impact on performance improvement. So both Dr. Gar and I will present different scenarios where we had QAPI projects, where with the physician improvement, the physician input, we we're able to greatly improve the quality of care for our patients. And then we really would like facilities to be able to share best practices from the audience. And so a couple of things on that, we do have both the chat and Q&A, and we really encourage you as we are doing the presentation, if you feel like you would like to add something into the presentation, or you even have a question that you want to have answered during the presentation, go ahead and drop that in chat. We'll be trying to monitor that chat. And then also at the end of the presentation, we will open up for a Q&A session. So anything in Q&A that we missed during the presentation, we will then get to at the end of the presentation. So now moving into QAPI and those regulations, I think since the start of 2016, when the new requirements of participation came out, acknowledging that in both phase two and phase three, there were new regulations around QAPI that really went to strengthen what CMS expected as part of the QAPI program. And so pulling directly from the language from CMS, and you will see that link at the bottom that goes right to the federal register where you find this language, that CMS is requiring all long-term care facilities to develop, implement, and maintain an effective, comprehensive, data-driven, and that's kind of a key word, data-driven, QAPI program that focuses on systems of care, outcomes of care, and quality of care. 
So the current regulation that was written into the new requirements of participation required facility to maintain a quality assessment and assurance committee consisting of the director of nursing, physician, designated member of the facility, and at least three other members of the facility staff. The QAA committee must meet at least quarterly and identify quality deficiencies and develop and implement plans of action to correct the deficiencies. And again, it gives you a reference right there to the Federal Register on that page. Now, if you look into the Federal Register, you will see later on in the section that it does specifically address IP. So the infection preventionists must serve on the QAA committee and report on the infection prevention and control program. If more than one person serves as the IP, at least one of those individuals must be present on the committee. And so one of the things that I really wanna talk about here as we have on the slide is they talk here about the regulations related to programs and committees. And you will see as we go through the presentation, there is a distinct difference between a committee meeting and a program. And so when we look at the QAPI program, that is the systems and structures that cover everything from day to day all the way up to the roll up data of what we're trying to achieve for quality improvement for our patients and our residents that we serve. Whereas you notice they call it the QAA committee is the quality assessment and assurance committee is where you are reviewing the data to identify what needs to be worked on related to the PI portion. So again, really separating that QAPI in and itself is not just a meeting. It is a system program, a process, a framework, you know, whatever the language you're wanting to use, but it is two separate actions. Quality assurance is reviewing the data against where you want to be. The performance improvement are separate actions where we improve the performance so that we can come back around and meet where we want to be on the quality assurance. The other thing that I want to talk a little bit about on the slide is about the the public health emergency and as we are coming out of the 1135 waivers. So initially when the public health emergency, CMS did provide some waivers that impacted QAPI and the physician involvement in the QAPI. So it allowed for our physicians to provide visits to the facility through telehealth and other digital means rather than coming to the facility. And what we saw in a number of facilities as the physician started to use that technology to attend QAPI meetings rather than attending in person. Also within the waiver, it gave facilities the ability to focus on adverse events and infection control and those aspects of care delivery most closely associated with COVID-19 and were not specific to the broad range of services that the QAPI regulation encompasses. So again, it allowed you to narrow your QAPI to only cover those things that were most important related to the COVID and the pandemic. We now know that as public health, while the public health emergency continues, the waivers have been discontinued specifically around QAPI and the physician visits. We have seen an uptick in F867, which is a survey citation that surrounds QAPI as it relates to cross-referencing for areas of quality of care not related to COVID. So again, they relaxed what they were expecting to see in your QAPI, but when they are having and going back into these buildings, now that these waivers have ended, they are seeing an increase in F867 when they see that the QAPI committee has not addressed quality issues that have significantly impacted the patient. So I did want to make sure I shared as we talk about regulations for QAPI, you know, we had phase two and phase three, both had new regulations related to QAPI. We had the waiver that came in, right, with the public health emergency, but that waiver has now ended. And if you have any questions related to those waivers or anything you want to put in chat, please make sure you do, and I will try to answer those questions as we continue to go on for the presentation. So now I want to talk a little bit about what, what should QAPI contain? And so what I really want to focus on is what CMS requires and what they expect to contain really follows evidence-based practice as it relates to QAPI. And so a number of years ago, CMS created a QAPI toolkit. And you will see the link here on 
B slide to that toolkit. And there are numerous documents and tools within that toolkit. And I really encourage you that if you do not have a strong framework, whether it's from your corporate entity or whether it's from something that you've had within your building, that this is an opportunity to look at the tools that are available to you so you don't have to recreate the wheel as we talk about what should be in that QAPI. I would also encourage you that to really compare what you have in your QAPI program against these elements that they say should be in there to make sure you meet those elements. Because when the state survey agencies are coming in on behalf of CMS, they are following the guidelines of this toolkit to identify if your QAPI program is robust enough to meet the requirements and is it driving quality of care? And so one of the elements that I really wanna focus on in element one, design and scope, is the fact that it should be data driven. So when you talk about the first bullet point of ongoing and comprehensive dealing with the full range of services offered by the facility, including the full range of departments. So we wanna talk about, you know, we need to make sure that within our QAPI and what we look at, how does environmental services impact the quality of care we have? How do dietary services, so our different departments other than just our clinical departments, that affect quality of care and the services we provide to our patients? You know, and as a building and operation, we may want to bring some financial measures into it. We want, may want to bring some census information into that. And that is great, but we do need to make sure it covers the full range of services we offer. And so when we look at, you know, having short stay, long stay patients, we know our quality measures segment those out. But if we have a large hospice population, what elements and what are we designing our QAPI to mean that it actually has those elements related to that hospice care? So second bullet point, it should address all systems of care and management practices and should always include clinical care, quality of life, and resident choice. And so when we look at that quality of life and resident choice, because I think we, we often cover that clinical care with our quality measures and some of that quality of life, but when we look at resident choice, are we tracking and trending and covering our grievances by our residents? Are we tracking and trending complaints that might be called into external sources? Are we looking at annually our resident and family satisfaction surveys as part of that full range of services to see if from their perspective, we are meeting their quality of care expectations. You know, within those satisfaction surveys, we often see those questions, you know, do you feel like you have a choice? Do you feel like they listen to you? And so part of that is, are we meeting that element of resident-centered care? in that design and scope. So making sure when we think about what we want in our agenda for our QAPI meetings, whether we're holding them monthly or quarterly, do we encompass over the course of time, all of those things are important to our business. We also wanna utilize the best available evidence to define and measure goals. So we wanna make sure we're getting data from a reliable source. We wanna make sure we are measuring the same month over month. And we wanna make sure we're setting goals within the design and scope of our QAPI so we know what we're trying to achieve. So element two, governance and leadership. And so within that F867 that I mentioned before, when I have looked at some of the survey citations in 2567s, the governance and leadership is often mentioned in how they cite F867 and that the leadership of the facility had not addressed in QAPI an element of quality of care. And so part of that, that is that the governance and leadership has to be more than one person. And I know we have almost 100 participants on today, and I, you know, I wish I could see the mix of what we had here, but I would guess that we have a lot of administrators, we have maybe some corporate team members, we have some directors of nursing and other clinical leaders. And so when you look at how to have an effective QA, QAPI meeting, an effective QAPI program, that program has to be consistent and sustained despite changes in personnel and turnover. And so how you do that is that you create a framework that is not person dependent, that you have more than one person within your facility that can not only participate in QAPI, but can effectively lead QAPI. And I think we've seen a lot of times where we have to quickly pivot just like today, but understanding that when you start moving around the times in the meetings, 
it does dilute the importance of what that meeting is, that when meetings are set, they should stay, and you're going to have more effective involvement with your medical director when you are consistent with your meeting times, when it is consistent and what it, it reviews, and that you make sure that you have enough resources that all of your staff are there. And I know Dr. Gar might address this, but to have an effective QAPI program, you don't wanna have your physician show up to the building for QAPI, ready to participate, and they're waiting for 20 minutes for that meeting to start because we didn't have our stuff together, that we didn't have the right resources and giving everybody the time to get the information together so they're, they're busy scrambling right before the meeting. So making sure as governance and leadership, we know what we're reviewing, we have a consistent way to review it, and we support the physician and being able to attend on a consistent basis by holding the meeting at a consistent time that we are ready and prepared when the meeting time comes. We also wanna create an atmosphere where staff is comfortable identifying reporting opportunities for improvement. So what does that process look like? Because again, we're creating a program, we're not creating a meeting. So we wouldn't expect our staff to come into the meeting in the middle of the meeting and say, hey, I know you're having QAPI, let me tell you about this problem that I found on the floor. What we really want is a process and a program where we gather information before we come into QAPI. And that any member of our team on the frontline staff feel comfortable bringing this to a member of our QAPI. And that's really included in the fact that one part of the regulation is that we have to complete training on QAPI. They have to understand what that means and their role in QAPI. If you have participated in a Joint Commission survey, you may have seen that the Joint Commission surveyor is asking the frontline staff, how do you participate in performance improvement? If you've applied for HCA Quality Award and have gotten to the gold level, I can guarantee during the site visit for the gold level award that those examiners are walking around and asking how those members of the team participate in QAPI. And the reason why an AHCA examiner would want to know that there is something going on with the frontline staff and how they're involved in QAPI is because it is a best practice to have frontline staff have a path to contributing to QAPI, which means they're participating and identifying where we're not meeting where we want to be with our big marks. And they are participating and understanding what we're trying to work on to improve our performance. So it is a two-way street information going in and up to the leadership of problems they may know, but information coming out of leadership out to the floor and what we're working on and how what they're doing on a daily basis contributes to performance improvement. So moving through the five elements and moving on to element three is the feedback data systems and monitoring. And this is really where that statement of being data-driven and effective in improving systems of care and outcomes of care really comes in. Because we have to have systems in place to monitor care and services, drawing on data from multiple services, sources. And I know for most of our, our facilities that are here, you probably use a lot of your CASPER report, your quality measure reports that come from your MDS department, it comes from the MDS submissions. But understanding that sometimes there are more timely sources that you can access and make sure as a team, you know the best available sources for the timeliest data available. And with many buildings moving to EHRs or EMRs, we know that we can get more timely data. We might not have benchmarks of state and national averages, but it is more timely data on the outcomes and the services of our care. And making sure we're looking at our data sources and we're pulling from that best source. We wanna make sure we have feedback systems that actively incorporate input from staff, residents, families, and others as appropriate. So again, going back to, we know we have those feedback surveys that happen annually for our residents, our families, and our staff, but on a more regular basis, how can they provide feedback? You know, do we have family council? Do we have resident council? Do we have staff town hall meetings where they can provide information to get feedback on how our systems are working. We wanna make sure there's performance indicators that are well-developed, monitored, and evaluated. So I think one of the worst things we can do is that we can ask for data or look at data and do nothing with the data. So one of the examples I always ask when I've done longer trainings is in the beginning of the day, I say, hey, you know, we have six hour training. 
do you guys want to take a break for lunch or do you just want to work for lunch? And everybody provides their answers. And then I say, oh, great. And then I just move on and never address the question of lunch again until we get to lunchtime. So if you're going to ask a question, we want to make sure we follow up on the information we receive from that and we measure how it changes with interventions. So if I'm going to ask if everybody wants to have lunch or if we want to work through lunch, then I'm going to take that information in. I'm going to quantify that information and I'm going to provide feedback to the group that I asked that question of, okay, we had 25% say work through lunch. We had 75% say we want lunch. So based on that data, we're going to go ahead and have lunch. So making sure that we, what was our benchmark of what we were going to reach before we decided what, what we were going to do? What did we do? Making sure we have an evaluation method of next time I have a meeting, did that work? Do we need to do it differently? On the next bullet point, adverse events will be tracked, investigated, analyzed, monitored, and prevented. So when we talk about systems and monitoring, especially when it comes to adverse events. And so whether you're talking about adverse event as significant as an elopement or an adverse event at the level of, you know, maybe a stage one pressure ulcer, all meet the criteria of a negative, an event that is negative impact on the patient. And so we want to make sure we're tracking them. How many adverse events have we had? What type of adverse events? What is the root cause of each adverse event? Are there patterns? How can we prevent future adverse events? And then are we monitoring with the interventions we put in place if it is truly preventing future adverse events? And on the last bullet point, identify how findings will be measured against benchmarks and our targets the facility has established for performance. And so one of the things that I really like to address when we talk about benchmarks and performance, the benchmark for building A and the benchmark for building B may not be the same. And so to say that every building wants to be above state and national average on every single metric that we look at is really not realistic because every building can't be above state and national average. Every building is not the same. And we also have to set realistic targets. You know, and a perfect example would be a facility that, that maybe was struggling in some clinical areas. They were maybe at the bottom and at the 10th percentile of facilities as it relates to compare to the state average on wounds. They would not set their goal necessarily that in 30 days, they're going to be at state average for wounds because we know that those measures, quality measures are based on MDS data. That MDS data does not always come off in 30 days based on how we do assessments. And so we want to make sure for our team, for the morale of the QAPI team, and for the realistic goal achievement of our QAPI program, we set those goals based on analyzed benchmarks. That we really look at how can those numbers change? What is a stretch goal to get to? What do we want to eventually achieve? And so it may be in 30 days we have three less residents on the quality measure report. It may be in six months, we are at state average. It may be in one year, we are, you know, top 90th percentile. And so you do have to look at the benchmark. Your benchmark does not need to be the same for every single measure. You look at your measure, where are you currently, where do you want to be, and what are those integral timeframes that you really want to look at to how you get to that timeline and that goal. So now we come down to performance improvement projects. Performance improvement projects are the PI part of QAPI. And so when we look at what CMS says is a performance improvement project, it is a concentrated effort on a particular problem in one area of the facility or facility-wide. The process involves gathering information systematically to clarify issues or problems and intervening for improvements. And it really does highlight that PIPs should be focused on problem prone and or high risk areas targeted to examine and improve care or services in areas in the facility identifying needing attention. And so a couple of things that I wanna hit on in performance improvement projects. You know, I, there's two, two kind of buckets of performance improvement projects. And I, I really wanna highlight that everything is not a large, performance improvement project. You kind of have two buckets. You might have your quick pips. Um, 
I think that I've heard them call different different things, but different organizations. Why I think Dr. Gar's organization might call them a QIP. You know, I've heard them called, a, you know, just a, just fix it. You know, wherever you do or however you call it, a quick tip is one where you you identify there's a quick solution, right? But you still need to have evidence and documentation for your QAPI program that you identified a high risk or problem from area. You were quickly be able to identify what caused the problem and quickly put in a solution. What the quick tip allows you to do is it allows you to continuously track and what that quick solution was, did it actually fix the long term problem? So it allows you to monitor sustained improvement over time as evidence to whether it's the state survey agency to CMS when they come in that yes, we identified that wounds was a problem, but what we identified was it was a coding error. This is how we fixed it. This is how we monitored it. And this is how we achieved sustained improvement. Now, when we look at what a performance improvement project is, there's a couple of elements that I really would like to explain that you should see in performance improvement projects. Performance improvement projects should be interdisciplinary. It should involve frontline staff. It should involve your medical director. You have perspectives coming from all sides. There are things your medical director or other providers will see that the clinical staff may not see. There are things that your frontline staff will see that you may not see. And when we talk about areas that are problem prone or high risk, it may also encompass near misses. And an example may be that you almost had a patient elope, but you were able to stop that patient before they got through the door. The door might not have been working properly, but the patient did not get outside the door. That was a near miss. It is not necessarily reportable, but it is something that came very close to an adverse event and might warrant a performance improvement project that evaluated how we almost had an elopement, how we can prevent future elopements or near misses in the future. Again, focus on that problem prone or high risk area. You know, an elopement or a near elopement as being a high risk or you might be focused on things like wounds. We are seeing a lot of increase in pet pressure injuries as a result of some of the quarantine and as a result of staffing changes that we know that that's become a problem prone area. And making sure that we bring frontline staff, medical director and clinical leadership together to work together to identify the root cause, to work on what may be multiple contributing factors in redesigning that program and how can we come together to then monitor what we're implementing is working for our staff and for our patients. So now we come down to the last element. Element number five is systematic analysis and systematic action. And so systematic action looks comprehensively across all involved systems to prevent future and promote sustained improvement. Monitor the effectiveness of the improvement to continue the improvement. And so this really is two elements, right? So when we go back to that example of the near elopement, the near adverse event, we can surely look at that door. We can look at what caused that code box to malfunction. We can surely have the maintenance man direct and fix that door so that door cannot be opened again unless it's intended to be open. But what led to that door not working properly and not being identified? How many doors do we have in the building? So when we look at how we fix a system versus fixing a door are two different things. And when we have something that is as high risk as a near elopement, we need to look at the entire system as a risk. What is our system for monitoring our doors? How often do we check the doors? Is that system effective? And so that's part of that systematic action versus task completion, making sure we're looking at it as a system. And then how do we monitor the effectiveness of what we put in place for the improvement? We can fix the door, we can evaluate all doors, but we need to make sure we have a certain period of time that we follow through to make sure what we put in place stays fixed. And one more note when we go up and we talk about the performance improvement projects, you know, I, I, I say this knowing that we have a lot going on in the skilled nursing facilities. I, I recognize the strain that the facilities are under. I have worked in facilities. I know there's a lot going on. But what I'd really like to share is you can only chew so much at one time. 
And so when we talk about performance improvement projects and it talks about prioritizing what is on your plate, you know, focus on problem prone and high risk, but making sure that we are also moving projects across from open to closure. So if you've ever worked with the QIO, one of our quality advisors on an infection control performance improvement project, we have what there's called an opening and a closing call. We open the project, we do the root cause analysis, we figure a team, we develop action plans, we then monitor with data when we get to the point where we reach our goal and we close that project. When you are opening up a performance improvement project, you need to establish what is your goal to completion of the project? What would you like to see to know that you have achieved that performance improvement? And a lot of that comes with, you might have to go from an outcome measure, which is your quality measure wound score, to a process measure, which is how many patients had new or worsened pressure ulcers based on an internal report where we're able to track it into the billing. Because you do not want to have performance improvement projects open endlessly because it prevents you from moving on more, more critical projects. So again, you really should have your performance improvement projects opening and closing within a three month time period. There's always gonna be exceptions, but you need to have what we call a process measure where you're measuring it from something that you can see, whether it's from the EMR, whether it's something you're tracking, are the changes that we're making, making a difference for a patient's quality of care day to day because again, we know that some of those reports, there's delays in those outcome data. So whatever is happening here today is not showing up in that report. So those are the five elements. And again, this was some bullet points that were taken from a two page, two page guide within the toolkit. So I do strongly encourage you to look at that toolkit. So now we wanna talk about kind of the summary of the format of an effective QAPI. When I talk about a QAPI program, again, that is not your quality assurance performance improvement committee meeting. It is the full program. PDSA and QAPI, so plan, do, study, act, the way we improve, should be part of our daily environment. You know, it, once you start teaching it and you start using it, it becomes a way you work every day. And so when we talk about a QAPI program, your daily stand-up meeting is part of that QAPI program. You will have a set of metrics that you talk about every day in your morning meeting. You might talk about census. You might talk about call-outs. You'll talk about changes in condition. You might talk about anybody you sent to the hospital. You know, so you have a standardized agenda and make sure you follow that standardized agenda, but you also talk about it in terms of quality assurance. You know, when you talk about, um, you know, what is our census? Well, how is it compared to goal? You still have benchmarks. You know, we had a patient that had this. What would we have expected that benchmark on that patient to be? You know, we had a change of a condition. The benchmark is that we called the physician and we used an SBAR to call the physician. Did we meet that criteria on that patient's change in condition? So again, making sure for whatever we're doing, whether it's our morning standup, whether it's the huddles, between shift changes, or whether it's our monthly or quarterly QAPI meeting, that we use a standardized agenda. That when we're completing performance improvement, we have a form that we document on, and it's a standardized form that makes sure we stay on track with everything that we do. I do suggest for the benefit and the engagement of your medical provider, and again, Dr. Gar may hit on this a little bit later, break it into clinical and non-clinical. We know within our performance improvement and quality assurance, we may talk about, um, we may talk about some non-clinical measures. We may talk about census. We may talk about call-outs. We may talk about turnover. And your medical provider and your medical director may want to sit in on that discussion. They may be engaged and want to know what's going on, but they may also have patients that are having changes in condition that they need to get to. And we do want to make sure we're cognizant. And so break it into clinical and non-clinical, allowing your medical director to leave if they need to. We want to make sure we're viewing numbers and data and not just feelings. We want to make sure we're comparing to benchmarks and we want to make sure we're always identifying and prioritizing opportunities for improvement. So whether it's our morning meeting and we finish and say, okay, you know, what are our opportunities for improvement today? What did we not do yesterday as well as we wanted to? What do we need to do better today? And then, so whether it's prioritizing your actions coming down that morning meeting, you might identify the need for a performance improvement project because of data in the morning meeting. 
your quality assurance committee meeting is not the only place that you might identify an opportunity for performance improvement. And so share that with your staff. Know that we may have to have an ad hoc. Let's say, okay, we identify this problem. Let's start a plan now. Let's not wait for a QAPI meeting. And so I'm just going to check briefly and see if we have anything in Q&A. And I don't see, let's see here. We do have one. Okay. So um, one of our attendees has asked, can we continue to do our QA via Zoom? It seems to work better in their facility with the limited meeting rooms. So when we talk about the regulation, the in especially as we talk about the public health emergency, the part about the physicians visiting the facility does not specifically apply or not apply to QAPI. And so what I would like to say is, can you absolutely, if that is the most effective way for you to complete QAPI, but I would say that you would probably even want to do that if you're in separate rooms, but have your physician in the building at the time. There are a number of things that often come out of QAPI that that might need a little bit more one on one attention, maybe between the DON and the physician of what is revealed during a QAPI meeting. If we have to quickly pivot into a performance improvement project, having the medical director in the building to be involved in that performance improvement project is very beneficial. And then that kind of goes into the smaller group. So I can I can very much understand that if you have a building and limited meeting rooms, because I have been in buildings like that where they're the only room you have where you meet. Um, I went to a building to visit and work with them and all they had was the administrator's office. That's where they met and did their stand-up meeting. So there was very limited space. And so can you be a Zoom with your medical director? But I'd, I, I would caution you if they don't engage because I think we've all been on two types of Zoom meetings. The type of Zoom meeting where everybody's on camera, actively engaged, participating in what is going on. And then we have the Zoom meetings where nobody's on camera. Everybody's multitasking because you can't tell a difference because they're not on camera. And you're not effective. And so when you think about the definition of QAPI, that it's data driven and it's effective. If you are meeting all of the elements of the QAPI requirements through Zoom, you can. And just make sure also that your physician is signing that attendance and that they're actively engaged. So I hope that answers that the question a, a little bit. I, I don't think you're in danger as long as the elements of the QABI program. And again, you want to make sure everybody's actively engaged. So thank you for that question. I ap appreciate that, Belinda. And again, please go ahead and continue to put things in chat and Q&A. We would really love to hear from you. And with that, I really would like to turn it over to Dr. Swadigar to really talk us through some best practices and do a little bit better job than I did about how can you get your medical director to not just be present like we saw in the majority of the answers that they're they're there. And I know you've seen a Dr. Gar where you might be there and you might answer a question, but I know that you have worked really hard with your facilities that you work with and become truly engaged in leading the QAPI program. So I hand the the microphone over to you, Dr. Gar. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was such a great um, talk. I was making notes and I'm hoping that I would be able to cover all the stuff that you had talked about because, you know, um, here you were talking and I'm trying to make notes to make sure that, you know, I need to address these. And then, Lisa, you came in and you said, hmm, these are the important elements. So we we seem to be on, a, on the same page, which is essentially what we, uh, you know, what is the benefit of having a medical director who is engaged in the QAPI? So, um, one of the things I would say is, you know, yesterday or a couple of days back, Lisa and I were talking and I, um, we, we talked about, you know, the engagement of medical director and, um, one of the things that I said to Lisa is that I cannot imagine, uh, you know, more engaged meeting where we are having more lively discussions than the QAPI. Um, and, um, and that is something that I uh, wanted to, um, you know, uh, really, I'm hoping that the facilities would be able to see as well. Um, uh, 
I think, you know, for me, for our facility, for example, our big QAPI meetings are those quarterly meetings. However, um, the um, monthly meetings are as important. So I would go back and talk talk about, you know, that questions that uh, the question that we got about, you know, can we have, uh, you know, uh, meetings that are uh, uh, on Zoom? I would say that sometimes when I'm not able to make it into a building, um, I am attending those meetings on Zoom. Uh, uh, the monthly meetings on Zoom, and I really try to be during that quarterly meeting. I really try to be on um, on site, and the reason for that is exactly that the engagement and uh, is much, much, much higher when you're attending in person. So I would definitely encourage that. The other thing is regulation. Um, there is. Um, regulation that governs us as medical directors being in those meetings. And I think that is where, you know, a lot of medical directors are invited to those meetings. Um, and, uh, but, but the engagement piece is so important. Um, uh, for me, I think, you know, how I am engaged with the, uh, with the facility is essentially, um, we are working very, very closely with all the other departments, um, like nursing, um, you know, our administrator is an active part of that, that meeting, but all the other departments as well. And, um, and you know, uh, we are together making a decision on what is important to our facility at any given time to make sure that we are approaching, you know, the right, uh, taking up the right PIP and, you know, approaching it from a multidisciplinary standpoint. Um, so I, um, you know, that is, that is the level of engagement that you really want your medical director to have in order to have an effective change. You know, we talked about the PDSA cycle, effective um, change in the quality measures as well. Um, and then um, let's see the next slide. So I, I'll give you um, a couple of notes that I had actually made when Lisa, you were talking. I think it's important for us to understand that, um, you know, our quality copy is a continuous process. It is not a meeting to meeting process, but more of a continuous process. So what we really do is the quappy meeting is that the big qu quarterly meeting is that meeting where we decide a lot of things but you know we do it on a monthly basis to see what we are doing and yes casper report is important and we are looking at it but you know we also uh, have our internal measures of you know how many pressure ulcers did we identify etc and me measure that, match that up to the CASPER report to see that there is that validity of data um, that, you know, your internal reports are sort of kind of matching with the CASPER reports as well. So that is important. And all systems of care is extremely important. The, what information I can give to the team and what I bring to the team is different from the expertise that a CNA would bring to a team or a dietitian would bring to a team or kitchen staff would bring to a team or EBS professional would bring to a team. And, um, you know, that is the, the importance of all these departments coming together has never been more evident than when, you know, COVID and all happened, uh, you know, the uh, COVID happened, because if we didn't have for example, EBS expertise, we would never know how to, you know, do a great job at infection control. That was so, so important during the COVID time. So um, one of the examples, the other, um, the other thing is that, um, Lisa, you mentioned, I, I had written a note uh, about near misses. Near misses are extremely important, extremely important. You know, you gave an example of someone eloping versus somebody almost eloping, you know, the difference between an actual IJ, an actual real uh, problem, real big incident in your, or adverse outcome for your patient and a near miss is truly only luck. 
So we don't want to, you know, we, we need to have that in our mind at all times. In the systems that broke down, it's literally near misses are because you had a stroke of luck and you didn't, you know, your patient was lucky and we were lucky. And that's why it didn't, you know, escalate to the actual problem. So look at near misses, not as something that we can ignore, but you know, that this, this is an opportunity that has been given to us that we need to fix the systems that we figured out were broke and so that we don't have that incident. So um, I, I would say near misses are very, very, very important to us. Um, and I would really strongly encourage all of us to think through that as literally a stroke, stroke of luck and an additional opportunity to fix the system before we actually got that IJ. So, um, so those are the things that I would uh, like to bring up. The other thing I would say is, you know, and my administrator would tell you, those um, zeros are, are a problem. So, you know, you had talked about being realistic in your expectation, being realistic in your goal setting and being realistic in reporting. We know that, you know, we are working with a lot of COVID data right now. And as soon as we see a facility giving either 100% or 0%, on you know vaccination for example the first thing we say is is there a data problem because that is you know that is immediately where your um you know your surveyors eyes are drawn everybody who is you know used to and uh, and experts in data are immediately going to say is there a problem so if your for example med error rates um if they're zero immediately they're going to say oh is there a problem or is this truly reflective of the data so i think we need to be very very careful about clearly stating very transparently stating the uh, uh, the issues that may be going on because they also give us the baseline on which then we can work and create systems um i would love to give an example of um so you know in our coffee meeting we have a really engaged group and we We'll talk about everybody brings in, um, you know, what tips do we need to, um, you know, take on. So we recently, so I, I will tell you examples of some tips that we have had. One was our behavioral health, um, you know, that has been graduated a long time ago. Like Lisa said, have it, you know, not super long, but long enough that you kind of see that that trend is continuing. So we. Um, decreased our use of antipsychotics by a lot. Like our antipsychotic numbers have been amazing, knock on wood, um, for, for some time. And the reason for that is we had introduced that as a PIP and we had, um, you know, we d didn't just discontinue medications. We came together as, you know, the big group and we had the nursing involved. We had activities coordinators involved. But, and we had the behavioral health or social worker involved um, and the pharmacist consultant pharmacist involved and we created a patient at risk system for that. But we created this whole system of keeping patients safe and decreasing the antipsychotic use by cre standing up a behavioral health system where we actively engaged people when we were going to do GDRs or gradual dose reduction on our doses. Uh, you know, the pharmacist was working in very close conjunction with the medical director. And what we said is, when you do GDR, you're going to prop, you know, make sure that there is a behavioral health intervention that we put in place for the patients to, you know, kind of adopt so that we are able to give that comprehensive care. And that's why we are able to bring our antipsychotic down. Our second, uh, the other thing that I do remember is, um, we just graduated our um, readmission rate, uh, re, uh, you know, that um, uh, rehospitalization rate uh, uh, PIP that we just graduated because we have had pretty good numbers for some several, several months. And we are like, yeah, it's time for it to, you know, graduate. We call it graduation of PIPs. Um, the, it doesn't mean that we don't stop, you know, trending the data, but. Uh, you know, we want to take newer programs so that we can have our systems get better. Our newest PIP that we are taking on is the pressure ulcer one. 
And like Lisa said, the pressure ulcer numbers have gone up pretty much everywhere nationally. And that is because during COVID, people had social isolation, poor nutrition, decrease in mobility, and we are seeing the effects of that and decrease in staffing as well. So when we were choosing the PIPs, you know, how, how do I contribute as medical director? Um, you know, from a nursing, if it was only limited to nursing perspective, then they would be saying, well, we want to make sure that we are changing people on time. We're turning people on time. You know, um, we are making sure that, you know, there's no shearing, you know, transferring patients appropriately, but it is a bigger program than that, right? As a medical director, I come in and I say, well, let's think through this, right? There are systemic areas and there are local forces, right? In, in patients like physiology. So then we kind of bring in that medical perspective. It is not just important for us to make sure that the patient is turned and you have a good bowel and bladder program and the patient is not sitting wet in their diaper. You also need to make sure, of course, the shearing and the nursing is expert on making sure that that shearing doesn't take place when you're transferring the patient, but also if a patient is malnourished, they are going to have skin breakdown. If the patient has skin integrity issues, for example, dryness, they are going to have skin breakdown. If the patient has low hemoglobin, the ulcers are not going to heal. So bringing in those perspectives, and so we are creating the system where we are involving the dietitian to make sure that they are they're involved because patient nutrition is important, our kitchen staff to make sure that the food is palatable, our, um, you know, grievances. And, you know, Lisa, you had spoken about grievances and how it is important. And I will say, yes, our facility does a great job of, you know, dividing non-clinical issues from clinical issues, but we were seeing a trend on grievances on, I press the call button trend, and that kind of goes right into staffing issues that kind of goes right into the patients are they being changed on time so we wanted to kind of address many things and this is how your root cause analysis and this is how your pip starts growing right to to do that um skin integrity issues pressure reducing devices these are all logistic issues right what are we using for um, for moisturizing patients and having those facilities change the uh, moisturizing soaps that we are using. We are looking at those things to make sure. And that is, you know, then it becomes, you know, an administrator issue because the logistics needs to be um, appropriate. So kind of, you know, it's not just, it can get very narrow and your results could be limited if you're, all departments are not engaged and especially your medical perspective is not engaged you can keep turning that patient who is who has poor skin integrity issues you know uh, because of poor moisture and you can um, keep turning that patient who has low albumin for example but if you don't have those things, you are going to be limited in the benefit of your PIPs. And I think that is where, you know, we find strength in having it truly interdisciplinary and um, giving in my input. You know, I'm so glad that my facility asks for my input. And I'm also very, I think, I hope that they are glad that I'm never shy in giving my input either. So I just give, wanted to give an example of, you know, how the PIPs need to have all these elements that we may not have if we are not involving our discipline and especially our medical director. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gar, for, for sharing your experience and your knowledge, and we really appreciate you joining us. And, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, on our last slide was also really bring in from my perspective of being a nursing home administrator and when I thought I knew everything and I had not included my medical director on my initial gathering root cause analysis. And, you know, I think that I have been blessed in the facilities that I have been in with medical directors that wanted to be involved and wanted to be active. And so I asked the question when I was working on a rehospitalization quality improvement project, was I telling a story with my data or did my data tell the story? 
And once my medical director looked at my graph and looked at all my data, she's like, well, that's a great story, but you don't have all the facts. And so when we started having a conversation, you know, I, I had this great pie graph um, with three hospitalizations by the medical uh, providers that were working, whether it was the, the nurse practitioners or whether it was the different physicians that were providing care to our patients. And I had, you know, one one provider that had more rehospitalizations than everybody else, and I thought I had it, right? We needed to educate this provider and figure out why. And of course, here comes my medical director, and he said, you know, Lisa, this is great, but you don't have all the information. Did you know that this medical director takes call more often on the weekends and at nights than our other providers? Did you know that he has no confidence in your night nurses in the information he's they're giving him? So he's more likely to send them out because they are not completing the SBARs and he's asked them to do so. So what went from me thinking I needed to educate a provider really was my medical director coming to me and being like, okay, let, let's get out of the facts. Let's we'll do a root true root cause, anal root cause analysis because you didn't ask the physicians their opinion yet. And so once we were able to actually bring that provider that didn't have confidence along with our, our third shift staff and get some education, what do we need on the SBARs? What are we not doing right? And we got that fixed. We were able to dramatically reduce our rehospitalizations. But again, when Dr. Gar talked about, if you don't have all the facts, if you don't address all issues, you're not gonna be as impactful in the quality of care. And so I would have only had half that impact, right? So by having my medical director involved, we were able to actually let my data tell a story and be effective in the interventions that we put in place. And so that's why I strongly encourage you as you're looking at performance improvement projects to make sure that your medical director and other physicians and providers are, are involved at the point of identifying problems, prioritizing the problems, and participating in that root cause analysis. And so, you know, I know we're coming up to the end of the session and I want to open it up. If you want to put anything in chat or anything in Q&A, we can see when something pops up or uh, Dr. Gar, I didn't know if you had anything else to share after, after sharing my beautiful pie graph. No, I think um, I, I have really, I mean, I, I will say that if your medical director is not yet engaged, um, I think it is an expectation from both. I, I hear uh, work with a lot of facilities and I hear sometimes that the facilities are hesitant to involve their medical directors, feeling like it is a waste of their time, but that is the best used time of a medical director. And I think, you know, inviting them and asking for their opinion um, it will give you results. And I think sometimes the medical directors are hesitant and sometimes, uh, you know, the facilities do need to make that extra effort to, to remind the medical directors that it is so, so important for their input. Um, you know, that is important. The second thing is um, uh, uh, that, you know, it, to, to your point, Lisa, I think when we look at data, it's literally, you know, every time I have a question, I, I think by now all my facility people are like, they will laugh at me because they will be like, they will say, oh, well, we are at, you know, on the CASPER report, we are this percentage and, or this is our number or this is our raw number. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. You know, uh, how does it compare to state and national average? How does it compare to what we did last time? How is it trending? Trend everything. Trend everything and you're going to know. The one thing that good that knock on what our facility does is um, we don't let it hit the state and national average. I think, you know, when we are trending things and we we don't, we are not comparing ourselves to state and national average so much as we are comparing ourselves to ourselves. And I think that gives us an idea of what is important, you know, to your point, what what is important right now what should go in the pits? Well, what you are not doing so hot on and you're trending the wrong way is what should go on the pits, is, it, it, even if it is not on the state and national average, I would say. Well, thank you, Dr. Gar, and thank you everybody for joining us. We did not have any questions come into the chat, but please reach out to Alliant, um, myself, if you want. We have all of the links for all of the resources with the CMS within the presentation, the slides are loaded to in the chat there. 
We continue to work on our CMS 12th scope of work goals, including improving the quality score, developing baselines for healthcare related infections, and reducing emergency department visits. You can reach out to Alliant Health Solutions with our program director for Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana is Julie Keeker. Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Tennessee is Leanne Sowles. And just know that you can reach out to us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and we have all past education sessions on our Alliant QIO YouTube. I hope you have enjoyed today's presentation and let us know what else you'd like to hear us present on. Have a great day.